Great. So, um, so this is uh, actually uh, turning into to uh, a recurring event now. This is the sixth meetup. Uh, if you're new to Product Loop, if this is the first time you're here, then let me just share why we're here and 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 and, and why we should have. I feel like we should have another meetup. Um, so, you know, there are plenty of gurus, authors, and master classes on how to do product right. Uh, I am, and everybody I've talked to, I'm still to find one single person who are satisfied with how they're doing it. They're definitely not doing it the way it's written in, in the book. So this textbook version of the product world just doesn't exist. It's a sham. Um, that's kind of my conclusion. And, and I think there's no alternative. Um, so if your organization is not doing it by the book, it doesn't mean that you are working in a toxic environment or everything is bad, right? Uh, the books are simply missing context. Uh, and an important thing. So Product Loop, this meetup is here to start a debate about what you can do as an individual contributor, as a team, uh, not what everybody around you, what the environment should do for you. Um, it's a start of a focus on, on just getting things to work, a pragmatic approach. So let's just start focusing on doing work that makes us both happy and, and also the bottom line happy. Uh, so let's level the bar so we can start having a discussion about where we go from where we are right now, not where we should be, um, where we go from here, right? So it's time to go into practice. Uh, that is the purpose of this meetup. That's why the Product Loop meetup was born. Um, that is also uh, why I started this Learning Loop mentor platform. So. You know, if we go into practice and not just rely on this dogmatic product nirvana that's sold to us by the books, then we need other pillars to lean on. So when we try to overcome challenges like we're going to talk about today, and it's quite hard to do alone and without support. And if we take the books out of the equation or at least not rely solely on them then uh, and just impl implement everything by the book, then we need support. So Learning Loop is a community for those of you who uh, would like somebody to lean on and support you on your journey uh, who want to talk to people who have been where you are right now uh, and can tell you their story of how they got out of that mess or how they solved that problem um, it's a platform where members can book one-on-one -on -one video calls with experienced product people to get qualified sparring um, and, and help from others who've been in the same situation before um, they can help point you in the right direction they can provide hopefully some confidence in, in taking that leap of faith that sometimes requires to grow out of your comfort zone. Uh, personally, I believe that this one-on-one -one format for mentoring and, and active learning is way more powerful than Facebook groups, master classes, or an infinite number of Medium articles that I, <laughs> I tend to scroll myself, uh, scroll through myself, uh, especially when it's about moving already experienced people like you. Uh, who already have the fundamentals in place, who already wrote, uh, read all the books, who are just trying to make it work. So that that's uh, kind of the premise of this meetup. Um, you need to apply to become a member. Uh, it's, it's for experienced product people who have a, a few years under their belt. If you feel like there's something for you, then uh, go to learningloop.io, create an account, and uh, then you'll hopefully uh, get approved uh, to, to become mentored. It's also to, to be honest, not to waste the uh, the mentor's time uh, and and to just you know focus on relevant uh, dilemmas, not getting a job. Um, so uh, today we'll spend this evening we'll uh, focus on uh, on prioritization and how that works in practice. Um, product prioritization is hard. You know, there's no secret recipe. There's uh, no scientific formula. There's no one size fits all approach to building a winning product roadmap. Um, you know, there are plenty of dilemmas. Do you focus on really big, high impact features, or do you prioritize getting a whole bunch of little features out the door? Do you focus on attracting new customers or satisfying the ones you already have? Do you invest in the platform and technical debt, or do you rack up just more technical debt? Uh, that needs to be addressed eventually or you know that do you focus on output you know features or outcomes themes or whatever uh, the questions are endless and 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 it, it, it becomes even harder when you actually want the rest of the organization to also act on it and and rally uh, around that um, so you know product prioritization is just a key part of any product team 
so a product team's ability to efficiently and effectively prioritize the work and resources tend to be this defining factor of uh, the performance of the team. Same thing with the organization. And same goes for your the entire organization. Uh, and that's actually a pretty good segue, I, I believe, to uh, to the first talk. So this is the uh, the the menu of today. Uh, we have Kaspar Kuhl, who uh, currently runs product ops at uh, the Danish hypergrowth scale-up called Plio, or runs product ops or is part of it. Casper will probably uh, probably define it more in more detail. I'm, I'm just making you trying to make you shine as much as possible, Casper. Uh, then please correct me uh, if if we got the stuff wrong. Um, so, and also Kla, who who is uh, have been at multiple uh, exciting places. Uh, Clio recently, TV2, UC, uh, a bunch of places uh, where she's run product uh, and a mix of being both tech and user research and business and quite interesting uh, uh, history as well. What's it, quite important or what quite exciting for me is that both Casper and Kla are mentors on the Learning Loop platform. So that actually means that if you find what they have to say exciting and, and think you can actually implement some of the advice they give, then it's actually quite possible to book them for a mentor call tonight. How about that, right? Um, so uh, first up is, uh, oh, not first up. I always forget about this. So actually for the sake of Casper and Cloud, I think we should just you know do a quick poll and get you going to not only drink wine, I can see, but uh, or beer or whatever you're doing tonight, uh, just looking at the pictures, but also be a, a bit engaged in this. So, so my question to you is, um, what is your biggest challenge in regards to prioritizing your roadmap? So please uh, just write in the in the chat. Uh, I would love to just have a a kind of uh, feeling of, of of what kind of things that you guys are struggling with or trying to handle right now. So just please write in 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 the chat. What is your biggest challenge in regards to prioritizing your roadmap? It could also be getting the organization uh, behind it or getting teams to uh, actually deliver on it, or getting your teams to remember what they promised. So technical debt versus solving new problems. That's a, a classic. And Christian Co. Uh, it's easy to prioritize, but difficult to actually make the prioritization stick for more than three months. Mm -hmm, exciting. So why would you want to prioritize for more than three months? That's also an exciting question. Uh, Mikhail, agreeing on the short versus long-term goals. And Yannick, you were talking about unclear business goals. So I guess product goals versus business goals. That's an exciting topic in itself as well. And Thomas is, talk, is, is struggling or concerned with aligning a new way of working with a legacy landscape that is complex. And just, yeah, trust for management. It's quite hard to do anything on a roadmap without trust. Just keep reading a, a few more. Uh, super exciting, uh, very um, uh, interesting dilemmas, I think. So lots and lots of little hairy, uh, little hairy, what I lost, lots of lot, lots of lots of little hairy things to localize on international sites and using consistent language to align priorities or impact and effort. Consistent language. So, is that like within the product team, or, but also, or is it outside, like like collaborating with other teams? Anyway, balancing internal execution and external improvements. So, I think Casper uh, and Cloud that that, that kind of gives a good understanding of uh, the kind of problems that people are dealing with right now, right? So, uh, oh, and also how to quantify opportunities sometimes hard to identify return on investment for stack ranking versus effort all right cool so uh with that in mind uh i think uh it's time to give the word uh, to casper so casper uh, uh who does product ops uh i guess uh <laughs> we will find out just in in a second at the danish hypergrowth scale up called Pleo. uh He's, he's, he's up first. And in his presentation, Casper will unpack different ways to efficiently and effectively prioritize work and align 
uh, on it strategically, both on a team level, on a product organization level, but also within the entire organization. So uh, to explain how is going to present examples of how they go about it at Playo. So I, I'm especially excited about that. Uh, I suggest that if you have any questions during Casper's talk, then write them in the chat and then we'll take them afterwards in the Q&A session immediately after the talk. So uh, take it away, Casper, just steal the screen. All right, I will st I will steal the screen. I am not that familiar with, uh, as you saw earlier, <laughs> this uh, Google Meets we use, I think, what do we use, Zoom? Yes, we do. Um, but I guess this also works just fine. So, so. Let, let's see if we can get this up and running. Okay, I'm, I'm trying stuff. Okay, I press, someone has raised a hand. Should we address that immediately? No, this was uh, sadly just a mistake. Okay. All right. Fair enough. No worries. No worries. I'm going to click this button and we'll see what happens. Can Anas, can you confirm that we can see, you can see this? Okay. Yes. Thumbs, there's a multiple thumbs up. Right, there you go. Great emojis. Okay. So uh, cool beans. All right. Let's, uh, let, let's uh, dig in. Um, Right, so this is the overarching topic, right? And um, super exciting, extremely broad. Also, I think this can you can have uh, many, many hours of conversations about this, but let's see how much we can cover within the next uh, 30 minutes. Just also honest, is there a Q&A after each session or is it at the end? Yes, okay. We'll, okay. we'll do a Q&A after, after, immediately after the session and, and people just write your comments uh, in the chat gotcha. and we'll, we'll, I'll just read up from there. Cool, beans. all right. so. This is more or less what we're gonna go gonna go through a brief intro to to what I am. Um, then we're gonna be digging into prioritization. Then we'll move into rallying, and then hopefully we'll see maybe some questions um, at the end. All right, let's go. This is me on the right. My name is Kasper Kuhlasen. I am a product director at Plio. Um, I've been with Plio for a little bit more than three years. Uh, I sit in product management and in the product leadership team. And I've been in, in a few different industries over the last seven, eight years, um, very much um, interested in and spending a lot of time on building both the sort of B2C products, but also B2B products. Um, and with respect to uh, the products, product operations um, a role, that has changed a bit, I think, since we last spoke, uh, Anas, but I'm working, working very closely with the product operations team uh, in the day-to-day -day at Plio. Um, more specifically, uh, I'm in what I think commonly is called a platform uh, area of, of the business, which is essentially a, a part of Plio that tries to set all of our engineers and product, the product managers and the designers up for success. Um, and fortunately, in that area, we have uh, product operations as well. So that was a little bit about this guy. And I was born all the way to the right on this little island called Bornholm, tiny little place, lovely place. Not this time of, uh, time of year, but if you get a chance, um, maybe May, June, July, August, go there. It's wonderful. All right. So Plio, maybe some of you know Plio, maybe some of you don't. Um, it's a fintech scale-up. I think we qualify as a scale-up nowadays. Um, and of course, many of you, when you think Plio, you think about this mechanical dinosaur uh, as the first thing, because that was actually the first Plio. Uh, you might not know this, but before uh, the FinTech Plio, this was actually the Plio of the world. It was sort of a mechanical dinosaur toy that you could buy. Uh, if you search for Plio or in Google, I think actually the dinosaur will pop up before uh, Plio if you go to images. Um, but uh, I'm not working on a platform uh, team to build better mechanical dinosaurs. It is actually um, this Plio that I work for. And it's a fintech scale up, uh, founded in 2015. Um, yeah, it's in the spend management space. Um, we have offices in, I think, six, eight, eight maybe 10, 10, 10 countries now. It's, it's, uh, we've been growing quite a lot, especially in the last couple of years. Um, when I joined, I think we were a little bit less than 200 employees. And now we are around 800 employees. Um, raised a boatload of, of, of cash, uh, recently raised uh, 350 million. Um, dollars um, and so on and so forth. So that's that's the player I'm referring to, and the player that I will be uh, drawing examples from for um, when we get to to that stage. A little bit, a little bit more about player. The idea is to make uh, people feel valued at work. I'm sure you guys have seen a similar chart like this in other contexts. 
And uh, we're here to become a go-to spending solution for forward-thinking teams everywhere. And that's sort of our primary mission as a company. For those who haven't seen it before, you know, it's something around a super smart um, you know, company card. It's also more than that, of course. It's invoice payments and we're working on credit and a lot of other stuff. But uh, it's really to make the life of uh, employees much easier with respect to, uh, to all these types of payments in, in your company. We're growing. I think we went through that. Blah, 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 blah. A bunch of people. This was in Spain two years ago. This was, uh, uh, this was in Croatia last summer. A Plio town. All these people, they went for a run in the morning. Like, so annoying. <laughs> Everyone else was like, screw that. But uh, these, were the, these were the folks who went out for a run. Uh, and then uh, wonderful time and grew, uh, we've grown quite a lot. And this is where we are now. Back by a bunch of uh, investors, blah, 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 blah. I think you can find this uh, real quick if you um, go and search for Playo on Google as well. So that was it. That was a little bit about me, a little bit about Playo. And now we'll dig into prioritization. Uh, okay. So first, a few reflections um, from my side before we dig in. And I think I touched upon this briefly before. I think prioritization and rallying, how to rally an organization, you know, are huge topics. Um, and then you can, you know, massive amounts of frameworks and ways of doing it and all these different things. So I also want to maybe preface this by saying, I am not one of the folks who have written a book on either of these topics. Uh, I see, I've seen how we do it in practice uh, at Plio, among other places. And that's what I'll be sharing with you guys today. Um, so on the topic of prioritization, I think five sort of high level uh, reflections from my side. It's extremely contextual. Um, one size does not fit all. And there are many, 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 many frameworks to choose from. Um, and this is the fourth one is actually also quite um, important to keep in mind, I think. And that is what got you here probably won't get you there. And what I mean by that is that as your company matures, go through different stages, you might need to rethink your ways of working, including how you prioritize. Um, and you know, measuring and evaluating opportunity costs can be extremely difficult. And that's also something to keep in mind uh, when you sort of dig into how you how how um, much time you want to spend on ironing out your prioritization framework. All right, here we go. So. In true product management style, I think uh, we should probably start with a little bit about the problem here, uh, not jumping straight into solution mode, um, which is something that we also, by the way, suffer from now and then here at Plio. Uh, it's a very common fallacy, jump straight to the solution. But let, let's um, try to, to talk a little, about, little bit about the most busy slide you're going to see today. I promise I'm not going to read this. I don't want you to read it. My point with this is there's a lot of challenges associated with prioritization whether it's about you know what you weigh you know do you care about accessibility do you cater to all markets and segments at the same time what about debt what about the customer what about all these different things there's a lot to take in and we're going to quickly move on from this because i don't want you to uh, to go through and read all the different uh, sentences there but one take on i think why i think it can be challenging to nail prioritization, especially at scale, is that it is hard to continuously and efficiently prioritize in a way that takes into account all the most appropriate variables and their most appropriate weights, weights at any given time to maximize business value in a changing environment. I, I try to capture um, as much as I could in this very, very long sentence, and we're gonna dig a little bit um, deeper. So this is at least how I would try to summarize one of the big challenges with the prioritization as we see it at, uh, at Plio. So if we look at continuously, as in you want to be able to do or to, to do great prioritization continually, well, why do you want to do that? Again, lots of words here. Don't worry, I'll, I'll try to read uh, much of it uh, as, as makes sense here. So prioritization in product or in any other line of business is not a one-off thing usually. I think you will probably still be able to find some companies that do sort of a yearly planning. I hope we won't see uh, many of those going forward. Uh, usually, prioritization in product is a recurring activity, something you have to do on a recurring basis, whether that's based on a quarterly cycle or a monthly cycle or two-week sprint cycle or whatever it is, or even in-cycle prioritization, it's a recurring thing. Um, it happens all the time. And, uh, and yeah, you want to sort of consistently evaluate 
not only your ability to, to prioritize well, but also what variables you take into consideration for your prioritization. And at the bottom here, and this was a question I, I kind of asked myself while I was doing this presentation, and you know, how do I know if I'm good at making decisions when it comes to prioritization? Now, whatever you're working on out there, like how do you actually know if your call to make A rather than B was the right call? And that can be very, very difficult um, to, to, to properly evaluate. Um, and something to keep in mind. All right, next part of my long sentence here was efficiently. So you want to be able to do this, you want to prioritize efficiently, meaning you don't spend an unnecessarily a large amount of time doing it. Um, so you want to run your prioritization processes with as little friction as possible. That could be based on automated reporting for some of the variables you take into account or any other way you can sort of reduce unnecessary friction for making your hopefully good and informed decisions. You also want to design your prioritization uh, framework to, again, it depends a little bit on your role in your company, uh, but if it's for yourself, you need to design it in a way that empowers you and your team to move at speed and deliver high quality on a recurring basis. If you want to set your teams up for success or your organizations up for success, you essentially have to, to consider the same. How can you essentially empower your teams to make great decisions um, in their different contexts? Uh, and the last part is also extremely underestimated. And that is, you want to do it in a way where it's easy for you to communicate to your customers and stakeholders what you've chosen to prioritize and why you've chosen to prioritize it. And that is a very difficult uh, exercise um, as well. We'll also get into that a little bit later when we talk about uh, rallying, by the way. All right, the most appropriate variables. What the hell is that? Right? I mean, it, we all work in different contexts. We all take different things into account when we want to make our prioritization, but that's exactly the point here. You know, whether you're a team that focuses on your infrastructure or your onboarding experience or your whatever, you need to figure out what are the most appropriate variables for you as a team to take into account when you want to do your prioritization. And that could be, you know, the voice of the customer or digging deep into quantitative data in, you know, whatever kind of data you're monitoring, or it could be the voice of the organization or, you know, what's the competition doing? All these different things. We'll also come, come back to that very soon. Now, this one is tricky. And uh, one part of the, this topic where you will see a lot of different models pop up. So how can you weigh these different uh, inputs that you have for your prioritization? Right? So let's say you're talking about uh, competition. Well, how, how do you weigh that? Like what the competition is doing? Is that a big thing or is it a small thing? How do you weigh the voice of your customer? How do you weigh the voice of your organization? How do you weigh your intuition? How much weight do you put on quantitative data analysis? All these different things. And so this is also something that you can uh, put on paper and formalize, or you cannot write. And just keep it in your mind and be sort of, oh, okay, well, I think this for now is this and for now is that. Uh, we'll also get back to this a uh, little bit later. Okay, well, you also want to max, uh, prioritize in a way that maximizes business value, right? It doesn't matter if you're working on infrastructure projects or you're working on the onboarding funnels or your some customer experience uh, part of your product's flow, whatever it is you need to figure out how can we maximize business value with the prioritizations that we that we that we were going to make um yeah and i think one big piece of that and i'm not saying this falls on the product manager or product owner necessarily it could also fall on an engineer or a designer or a user researcher or whatever depends on the context you have in your company but it's extremely important that you figure out how does the work that we do as a team or a unit or an organ part of the organization relate to the bigger picture right We'll also get back to this uh, and how we do it at Pleo. So that was a little bit on some of the big sort of chunks that I think we need to focus on when we talk about prioritization in, uh, in product. And uh, let's maybe zoom in a little bit more. So how can you prioritize in practice and what not to do? And uh, yeah, so I, I think I alluded to this briefly uh, earlier. There are so many frameworks that you can choose from when you want to do prioritization, right? I'm sure you guys have seen this. You might maybe also use this. Totally fine. Um, there's this beautiful model. Uh, you know, you have this one. You have Monte Carlo simulations. You have, you know, rice frameworks. Uh, Moscow. I mean, I, there's so many frameworks to choose from, right? And this one, I can't remember what it's called. Um, 
And my point is, there's so many different frameworks to choose from. And to be honest, I think you can actually learn a lot from using a lot of them and see what works for you and what doesn't work for you. We've certainly done that at Plio. We've gone through many different types of prioritization frameworks. And some of it works, some of it doesn't work, totally fine. You bring um, what works from some of them and you leave what doesn't. So what I think you should not do <laughs> um, when it comes to prioritization, and that is uh, you shouldn't be saying yes all the time. Um, and this is harder than it sounds, by the way. Um, I think that this is also something that probably resonates with a lot of people who work in product. This can also be very difficult, especially if you have high-ranking stakeholders who wants to get something in particular done. But you shouldn't let the loudest voice dictate priorities. It should be a part of your input sort of catalog. And you need to figure out, of course, how you weigh that back to our previous point. You should not lose sight of your company's direction and your ability to, to sort of tie your work into that as well. That also relates a lot to the rallying topic we'll get to. And uh, this is a big topic at Playo, by the way, these days. You really, really uh, um, shouldn't underestimate the time it takes to truly understand your customer. And it might sound by now like we, we kind of know that, like everyone knows that who works in product or work in engineering, whatever it is, no, customer obsession and customer centricity and everything. It's much harder than it sounds, uh, and it, it's, it, it, it takes a lot of time um, to actually spend time with your customer and understand what pains and problems they actually have. And then lastly, uh, the importance of, um, um, I think you see we have some great comments in the chat, uh, that you shouldn't underestimate the importance of communicating what you prioritize, uh, to get buy-in, to get people to rally towards what you're doing, and just to maybe get stakeholders off your back, all right? So there, I think there are different uh, values to, to doing that. All right, let's see what happens next year. Making hard choices, and, and we're going for the from the dark theme now to the light theme. I don't know what that means, but let, let's see what comes here on the on this slide. So at Plio at least, what we expect our product teams to take into account when they prioritize in their different contexts, and we, I think we have 30 product teams-ish, so something like that. We expect them to take into account our uh, company values. I'm sure you have company values wherever you work. We, uh, someone joined, okay, admit. Um, we expect our teams to take into account the company's vision, mission, and strategic direction. We expect them to take into account our product development principles, our KPIs, whether that's for the company or for the area you're in, as well as the team and area uh, strategies. So these are some of the high level uh, variables that all teams have to take into account and have to sort of bake in uh, to, to, to also show and argue for why they've chosen, chosen to prioritize what they what they've chosen to prioritize. Now, that was just the start. There's much more that we want them to take into account. Customer needs and feedback, market trends and competition, what are their resources and how are they constrained by those resources, urgency and deadlines, there might be some super urgent projects that are in your area that need to get done, also uh, not to underestimate. And we had a question, I think, about this or a topic or a comment, sorry, in the chat about debt. We'll also double click on that later. Technical debt and sort of sustainability and scalability is also something we, we expect our, our teams to take into account. Stakeholder alignment, you know, internal stakeholders also uh, on a recurring basis needs to be, to be addressed. Risks and uncertainty, churn data. You know, why are people leaving your company as customers? Very underestimated golden source of information. Lost deal data, also extremely important to know why are sales not closing deals? If it's a, you know, if you have a sales organization, of course, or customer success for that matter. Um, review site data, do people like what you're doing? Uh, do they express that on Trustpilot or app stores or whatever? Um, what are you already working on? Also important. And uh, dependencies in and out. I'm not referring to the uh, burger chain here. I'm referring to the fact that many teams, at least at Plio, will have dependencies from other teams to them, and our teams will have dependencies from them to other teams. And that's also something uh, to take into account when uh, you prioritize at uh, Plio. So this is a, a big list, of course, but just to tell you, this is the complexity that our teams are expected to deal with and uh, to argue their case. I'm not saying they need to go through all of these and say, with respect to urgency and deadlines, uh, this is how we weigh it. You know, that's not the, uh, the, 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 the ask, 
but we expect that they at least consider these and, and make a well-informed decision on their prioritization. On the topic of debt, and I love this topic, and this is a big, hot, uh, spicy topic these days in Playo. And I think maybe it's, maybe it's because of the growth we've gone through, or maybe it's just because of the negligence, but we have accumulated uh, debt in the company. I think that's probably the case for most companies. You can't prioritize everything at the same time. But when it comes to debt, I think there is a tendency to think about tech debt. And of course, tech debt is also a real thing and something that needs to be addressed, but it's not the only thing you need to take into account. You have design debt, maybe, user experience debt, organizational debt, all these different types of debt that you need to figure out how do you want or do you want to prioritize it in your roadmap or your planning or whatever it is um, on a team level, on an area level, on an on a organization level. Um, and you know, debt can be fine. You know, you can take on debt in the short term, and that can be totally fine because you want to do something quickly, you want to do it now. But eventually, it's kind of like taking a small loan, right? You take a small loan now, you can buy the television, you can buy the car, whatever you want to buy the phone. And then you take another loan, you take another loan, and all of a sudden, your interest needs to be paid, and then it starts to hurt, right? Um, and so that is also something that, that very consciously and strategically has to be considered, um, not just for a team, but it's a company. Um, and that is also certainly something that we um, take very seriously. Okay, a bit of a busy slide here. I apologize. We're going to talk a little bit about waiting and context. I hope this won't come as a surprise to any of you, but I think it's worth double clicking on a little bit. So what you see here at the top right is what we just went through. And let's say we have three teams um, at Clio as an example, right? or any company. Team infra, team onboarding, team product-led growth. Okay. Let's move on. So these three teams, they want to build a plan that maximizes business value based on a thorough and strategically anchored weighting of the most important inputs. That will trickle into some kind of roadmap, some kind of plan. And, and that's what all these three teams want to achieve. But all these three teams don't operate in the same context. They all need to adhere. Let's just take Clue as an example. They all need to adhere and relate to these high level sort of directions that we have, but there's also way more to it. So let's take the um, uh, catalog, if you will, of inputs that we went through before. And then if you talk about the um, team infra, right? Well, team infra will weigh all these different uh, categories in one way, and that's fine. Team product-led growth, they will look at the same different variables and they will weigh it in a different way. Team onboarding, same thing. They all want to get to a similar state, if you will, or and achieve the same thing, but their context is completely different. And that's totally fine. And so an infra infrastructure team might look more at debt or existing projects or whatever, whereas an onboarding team might look more at, uh, let's say, uh, quantitative data and you know customer feedback and so on and so forth. And that's totally fine. And that's also something that we certainly respect and acknowledge at, at PLEO. A few high level considerations on um, the idea of prioritization. And this is also, I think you also referenced this, Anna, in the, in, the, um, in the sort of preview text. And it's also a hot topic today at Pleo. Um, do we do outcomes? Do we do outputs? Do we do something third? You know, what about impact and all these different things? And I think the way we're thinking about that Pleo is that you kind of need both, right? Um, you need to, to think in outcomes and you need to probably work on your outputs and you need to tie it back to your outcomes. And that is um, a, um, one of our great colleagues in uh, sort of put it in, in, in this visualization for those who are not familiar with the framework. I think this is a Facebook uh, example, by the way, but it, it, it explains pretty nicely why. What is the business impact you're going for? Well, you want this high level KPI of user retention to increase. You can do that in many ways. We have a strong hypothesis that if we work on the outcome of getting users to invite five friends within the first week, then we'll see an increase in user retention. And some of the outputs that we can work on to achieve that outcome are these three different categories and many, many others, I'm sure. And that is also how we would like our teams to think when they formulate their prioritization and build their roadmaps. Um, so just throwing that out there, it's not something for everyone, of course, but that's how we do it at, at PU. This one is also interesting, I think, um, is when it comes to prioritization, you can, and we actually have experimented with this, do some um, mathematical weighting of your variables. 
And ultimately, of course, you, you, this is based on some kind of subjective uh, or group decision on what is most important when. But um, this can be a good exercise if you don't have a good um, framework in place already. So just put it on paper and say, okay, we actually believe that with respect to these uh, variables, we think it's one important or two important and three important, and then calculate a weighted, a weighted score for, for the projects that you, um, you might want to be working on. And then let, let that score dictate your prioritization, essentially. Um, and if anyone wants, this is something home cooked, by the way, uh, from product operations, actually. Uh, so if anyone wants to, to borrow this, uh, feel free to just ping me and we can send this to you in a nice cleaned up state. Uh, it's extremely simple. I'm sure you can also put it together uh, yourself, but uh, let me know. Um, one thing we also experimented with at Pleo is using uh, tools, software tools to, uh, to do scoring. And maybe some of you are familiar with the product board. They have some pretty cool features, actually, um, where you can do this. You can assign different weights and you can you know, calculate user impact scores based on criticality and urgency and all kinds of variables. Yeah, it's pretty smart. Product board is a pretty expensive tool. Just want to throw that out there. So uh, I think you should uh, carefully consider how you're going to use it. Um, but my point is, this is also a great source of inspiration. And to one of my first points, what got you here might not get you there. And so we used to use product board. Now we're moving away from that, but we brought some of the learnings we, brought, we, we got from product board and moved it into our current framework. And that's also, I think, how, how it's supposed to be. So you need to decide, you need to communicate. And uh, I think I'm gonna end on not the full presentation. Uh, we, we have a little bit left on rallying, but with respect to prioritization and mapping that out, I think this is very, very true. And it, um, it is essentially a way of um, thinking about, I think we call it uh, progressive, progressively detailed roadmaps, right? So the further out in the future, the less uh, certain you will, we will be on, on, on what you'll be solving or what solutions you expect to have for, for your problem. And the closer you are to, to today, the more clarity, the more details you need to have on your problem, your solution, the whole thing, right? And this is also something we expect from our teams to be able to formulate when they have made their prioritization uh, clear. Okay, big breath. Just, uh, we, we, we're getting there, I promise. This is the last piece of the presentation, so, uh, so brace yourself. Uh, we have a few more minutes left, and I'll, 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 I'll try to do this uh, uh, quickly. So last part of my presentation is with respect to rallying your organization and also something that I think is extremely important to, to, uh, to, uh, to work on. Oh, great question. Okay, we're going to get to that, I think, afterwards, um, which is, by the way, also a very hot topic, uh, the idea of uh, public roadmaps. So what's the problem with respect to rallying your organization? Again, don't read this. There's a lot of problems, a lot of challenges associated with being really good at rallying your organization towards your product prioritization, if you will. So, so, so I think you know what format works best for the audience. What format works best for you? You know how how do you balance details and then high level uh, ambitions when your audience is so diverse? If, you, if you're speaking to a nice group of people and so on. So, let's dig in and um, and 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 um, go through this. Now, this particular slide seems oddly similar to the one I had at the beginning. There are few there are few things I've I've, I've replaced here, but my point being. Um, Again, it's extremely contextual whether you are what what constitutes good with respect to rallying your organization, right? Again, one size doesn't fit all, many frameworks, what got you here, it won't get you there. And I think one thing that we are investing increasingly in at Pleo is actually something as simple as storytelling. Uh, and, and 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 storytelling is not something that is intuitive and easy to do. It, it's actually quite quite difficult to build a compelling story up around something that could be extremely technical, as an example, or why you want to work on debt and so on. So also something that we prioritize quite a lot at the at PO. Uh, I couldn't help myself but bring in, a, in, a, in a, at least one definition uh, in, in my presentation. So what does it mean to rally? Well, it means to come together in order to make a shared effort. I, it's probably one of my favorite words, actually. I love the word rally. Uh, so let, let's, uh, let's, let's dig in. And one of the topics that I think we should uh, double click on here is on the topic of abstraction and audience. Okay, what does that mean? Well, again, shouldn't be a surprise to any of you on the call here. 
but rallying one group of people in one way might not rally another group of people in the same way, right? So if you're giving a big presentation to, a, to your company or whatever, just, to, just your team with all kinds of different people on it, um, you might want to position it uh, so that it, it, it fits with the audience uh, in, in a compelling way. And it's, it's no joke, it's not easy, it takes time. Um, and it's extremely difficult when your organization grows um, to, to a certain size, right? Like now we're 800 in Plio, it, it's certainly diff more difficult now than when we were uh, 200, I can, I can promise you that, uh, because the complexity of the audience has changed so much. Again, if you want to rally you know, an individual contributor engineer in, let's say, the infrastructure team, and you want to rally a senior marketing director in another part of the business about the same thing, you probably have to speak to these people in two completely different ways. And this is also something that we expect our product people to, to, to do um, as well. So let's take a very real example from Plio. Um, and by the way, it's Plio's birthday today. I forgot to say that, it's eight, eight years birthday. So we have a hundred people out here eating candy floss and running around drinking drinks. So if I sometimes look up, it's because people are, are running around and behaving uh, in good ways. Uh, for the most part. Um, okay, a real example here. At Leo, right now, we are investing in upgrading our infrastructure by leveraging something called GitOps. Some of you might be familiar with that. And one of the things that GitOps will allow us to do is it will make it easier for us to build and create new environments, like you have a production environment, a staging environment. Now we can spin up endless amounts of environments much faster. Okay. You can use that to you know, test your work even better than we could before, all these different things. So it's a very sort of technical project that lives in our infrastructure. It's quite complicated. Um, and it's actually something that the previously mentioned team infrastructure would own. It's not called that here, but it's the same thing. So how do you take a priority like investing in, in GitOps to solve some of the problems I referred to before? Sound? sexy, exciting, and like something you can rally towards as a company. Um, and ultimately assure our stakeholders that um, it's a good idea to spend time on that. Well, maybe let's start with a problem uh, and um, explain why it's important for Plio as a company. Again, in business slide here, I apologize, uh, but how could you package something like an infrastructure project and turn it into something that you could actually rally towards as a company? Well, here's an example, how, and what we expect, by the way, of our product teams to do. So, business context. We're shipping too many bucks to production, which causes a subpar customer experience, and that in turn increases the likelihood of a lower net promoter score, higher churn, and lower revenue. On top of that, because we have a limited test environment, our sales and customer success colleagues use an inferior environment to demo our product to customers, which in turn reduces our ability to close deals and grow revenue, and so on and so forth. Ultimately, solving these problems is extremely important for our business and organization. So with just a few words, you've taken something that to most people would be extremely unexciting, like an infrastructure project, and turned it into something that is extremely exciting for people in sales, customer success, for our C-suite, and we expect all of our product people to be able to communicate their priorities, priorities in this way. Uh, so as an example, as an engineer, we'll give you a brand new test, test environment, where you can test your, your code before you ship, ship to production, making you happier at work, you ship fewer bugs, blah, 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 blah. As a sales rep, you know, you get a great demo environment where you can show your prospects the latest version of our product, da, 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 all these different things. We expect you get to get higher closing rates and so on and so forth. As a CRO, all of a sudden you should start to see um, an increase in revenue due to higher customer conversion rates and so on and so forth. As a CTO, you'll start to see a big drop in change failure rate, meaning fewer bucks and instance created, and so on and so forth. And just like that, we expect our product people to take their prioritization, whether it has to do with infrastructure projects or not, and tailor it to the, the, the company in, in such a way. Yeah, this is the same as we just went through, right? Different audiences, different way of, of, of explaining it. Okay, we're, we're getting there, I promise. So at Plio, we have what's called a, an operating model where we have certain ways of working that we can leverage to rally our organization. So we have business model and then we have an operating model. So in our operating model, we have what we refer to as practices and artifacts. 
And we use these practices and we use these artifacts to rally our organization on a recurring basis towards our direction as a company. And we try to essentially bake this rallying into our, let's call it cascading strategic alignment efforts. So we rely a lot on our team members, also our team and domain leaders to really push their prioritization agenda. We have a strategy cycle that includes standardized artifacts and fixed ceremonies where everyone gets together to rally against the priorities of the company and of the teams. And yeah, we celebrate on a recurring basis and so on and so forth. And then we have something that we call, and I think this is the second to last slide. We have something that we call our information sharing practices, and they help us stay aligned, excited, transparent. What is that? Well, we have town halls on a recurring basis. We have all hands on a recurring basis. We have newsletters going out, different title Slack channels where we do all this, and then we use Notion also to, to document all these different things. And that's actually the end of the road uh, for this presentation. Um, so I think we, we covered some, some ground on, on, on how we think about what you need to take into account when you prioritize at PLEO, and a little bit on um, how we uh, think about it when you want to rally uh, the people that we have in the company towards um, whatever you choose to prioritize. And this is, I had to put it in here. We are hiring. <laughs> uh, go to uh, this site, and I'm sure you can find some, 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 uh, some, 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 some interesting uh, opportunities as well. So that's it. Anas, I'm going to shut up for now, I hope, <laughs> and, uh, and see what happens. Well, thank you so much. Uh, let's just, can we just overwhelm Casper with a, a round of emoticon claps here? Just, just uh, fired away. Awesome! Now that's uh, that's a real uh, that's a real applause right there. Super. So um, I'm just uh, let's let's go for Q and A right now. So I'll, I'll just kick start it, and and uh, after that I'll uh, I'll read up from actually the quite good questions that came. So um, how do I start with this question that I have? You know, I I, I got overwhelmed with all those things that you need to take in, into account, and I'm thinking like how can one human being actually do all that have all that in the mind in their minds right and then you start scoring you know a lot a lot of stuff gets gets lost in translation and i just you know i just kept thinking like what role does the intuition of the product manager play in all of this i use that that strategic sense right you mentioned storytelling but can you tell us more about that do you use it also for prioritization prioritization and not just uh, uh, for rallying um yeah big time i think our intuition is uh by the way also underestimated uh, because most of the time at least after a certain period of time the and it, by the way this isn't necessarily a product manager it can also diff be different people doing the prioritization right but whoever does that their intuition will eventually be very very strong because they will be the experts in their areas right and they will already be on a recurring basis talking to customers and speaking with people internally and reading the latest and the greatest from the market and all these different things so Intuition can be extremely underrated, actually. Uh, mm -hmm. So we certainly, we certainly also take that in, um, seriously. Uh, you, I, we don't think that you should only rely on your intuition, by the way. And that's also what I try to get across in the sort of context uh, vibe that I try to present that, you know, in some parts of the business, you might weigh intuition much higher than in other parts of the business. And that's totally fine. Um, but you need to make that case, at least. So when you do show up with your roadmap and you say, guys, Here's a roadmap, and you know I built it based on my intuition. I'm like, okay, fair enough. But then you should also at least be prepared to answer a couple of questions, right? And mm. and and that's that's how we go about it. So I, I think you know that that's a pretty good segue into the first uh, question by David uh, on the intuition of C level people. Um, David, can you uh, can you just state your question uh, out out in public? Yeah, for sure. Uh, what I have often experienced is that uh, some C-level, some management uh, comes by my table and just mentioned that he has seen something or got persuaded by the client that feature X is the most important thing ever to do. And then this is something we need to do. It's something we are forced to do. And I have actually not a good strategy right now to just do something more important instead. If they just come to me or come to my team and say, hey, Dave, this cool new feature, we need to have it. Or 
do you know our competition? They already have this feature. We need to have it. They don't see that this feature may make sense in their ecosystem, but not in our ecosystem. And then it gets tricky. Sometimes I try to tackle with Yakni like you don't need it, and it will just have a lot of cost of carry. But uh, sometimes it's just not enough. I think, you know, I think that's a common thing. I think many people experience that, um, whether it's C-Level or someone else, by the way. Um, so I think there are different ways, ways to answer that question. And I can, I can tell you how we try to go about it in PLEU. And, and that might not be the greatest answer because it can be very difficult to change some of the things that I think we're doing um, in, in another context. So in PLEU, we, and I think we've overcompensated, oh, by the way, a little bit on this, but we have invested a lot in autonomous teams and sort of decentralized decision making. And that for good and for bad. Uh, because at a certain scale, that can also be very difficult to actually manage. But one of the consequences of, of that is that we trust our people a lot out in the teams and the domains to make the right decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, but to, I think, what Anna said at the beginning of the call, right, with great power also comes great responsibility, right? So if you recurringly make decisions that are not good, despite all this autonomy and so on, then you also need to be held accountable to that, of course. And so we don't see that a lot in PLEO because the C-suite, as an example, they are not in there. It's too de detailed, right? They are way further ahead thinking about strategy, where are we two or three years from now, whatever. Um, so then they're not really in there. I think we have seen it a few times at PLEO. And I can, I can tell you what, what the product managers have done in some of those cases, and that is to build the case for not doing it, if, if they truly, because sometimes you could also argue the C-level person or whatever it is could be right, you know, that's also an example, that could also be the case. And so I think just because a C-level comes and says something doesn't have to mean it's a bad idea, right? Uh, so I think there's also something there. Uh, on the other hand, if you truly do believe that it's not the right decision as the expert in the area, what we've seen some product managers do is to build as good a case as they can for not doing it, and then ultimately, there will be a chain of command, uh, and and you know then you can be overruled, right? Um, mm -hmm. And that's unfortunately the a part of the game. But we've had some PMs who really put up a good fight, and sometimes won, sometimes lost. Um, yeah, yeah, it's a little bit sad. I mean, uh, autonomy is a good point here. The team should feel autonomous, which means have all the power of the team itself, the tasks, the tools, the time. But uh, then someone else from the outside comes from the organization and just say you need to do it. And then the autonomy itself feels a little bit crushed. Yeah, I, th I think one way of playing around with that can also be to, like, what is your cycle time? So for how mm -hmm. long a period of time do you sort of set your strategic direction, right? If, if that's on a quarterly basis, and that's how it is at your company, then you also shouldn't expect, as in the C-level person, shouldn't expect to be able to come in and direct anything uh, mm -hmm. until that quarterly strategic direction changes, right? Which could be at the end of the quarter. And so I think there are different sort of ways you can sort of push it, but some of them are quite organizational in nature. Mm -hmm. And so I think on the team itself and for the PM or whoever it is, I would invest in, in building the case, um, tapping into some of maybe the categories that I went through earlier. Maybe you can say, well, we can see, you know, 80% of our churn, they all reference this. And you're telling us they reference this. Mm -hmm. well, well, okay, <laughs> then you can at least have that conversation, right? Uh, so, I, I, okay, I think um, that's enough from my side. Uh, yeah. I hope I hope Perfect. I answered the, the question. Let, let's sure. let's cool. move on to the next one. Uh, out of Thank respect you. for for everybody's time. So, Karen, uh, can you quickly state your question? Um. Yeah. Um. I really just wanted your opinion on uh, public facing roadmaps. I was asked about it recently, and. Um, I don't want to do it really. So, uh, yeah, any experience around that would be great. <laughs> great question. Great question. And very hot topic. Also, and there are many hot topics at Bureau these days, um, but that's actually one of them. We are right now working on our first ever true public roadmap. Um, and I think when, they, when you talk about public roadmaps, the way we see it is that there are some two variations of that. There's a internal public roadmap so what you promise your sales organization your customer success organization and so on and your whatever the whole organization and then there's one that you actually put on a page somewhere that anyone can go and see or maybe your customers can go see whatever right we're, we're kind of trying to do both right now uh, i think actually uh it can be very 
good to do it because it also forces your teams to make very thorough discovery and to make very well thought through informed uh, prioritization on what they want to do right i think there's sometimes and this is my personal opinion sometimes we can also hide this sort of uh, we don't want to commit to anything under this sort of agile philosophy, like everything has to change. And like, it, 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 I buy that, but I also don't buy it entirely because ultimately your salespeople, again, this depends on the organization, but if there are salespeople, they want to promise their customers something. Like, where's the company going? Like, they want to maybe sell something that you don't have today, but you have a month from now or two months from now, but if they don't know what's coming, they can do that, right? And then you're going to lose the competition. And so I think there is a balance between being agile and agile, but also committing to something. Um, and we are certainly moving in that direction. Um, so I think, I think it's a, generally speaking a good thing, but you also need to figure out what abstraction layer are you committing to? And, and I think that's, um, that can be difficult. All right, thank you. Uh, Emil Brockenhoops, do you want to state your question? Yeah, sure. So uh, first off, Casper, uh, thanks for presenting. I guess my question was, you were talking a little bit about, about products and you had moved from, from this one product to, to now something else greater and better to help you manage your priorities. Uh, and you took the best from that, that old platform with you. I guess I was considering what are like the principles? So what are the, what's the good things that you're taking to to manage prioritization, what's what's the guiding principles that you have at Playo? Oh, you're unmuted. I don't know why that happened, Casper. No, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yes. As I was reading your other question, and uh, yeah, that makes um, that's a great question. Uh, so, I think um, one learning that we've gotten, regardless of the framework we've used, is that one size won't fit all. So we can have different teams using different prioritization frameworks. And that's also okay, as long as they can make their case for, for, for what they've prioritized and, and why they've used, you know, chosen a particular framework. I don't know how many prioritization frameworks we have in PO today and how many are being used, but I'm pretty sure we have a lot. Um, I can speak on my own behalf and, 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 and say that I think where in the position I'm in now, uh, where we've actually just literally uh, today launched the strategic direction of, uh, of Playo for 2023, is that it becomes increasingly important, I think, as we grow as a company, that you as a team can tie your prioritization up to the strategic direction of the company. Whether that's to uh, company-wide KPIs or it's company-wide strategic objectives or you know the mission of the vision, it tends to be quite fluffy, but that is increasingly becoming important. And then there are certain narratives that we drive on a X time frame. So right now, as an example, I hope I'm not uh, spilling <laughs> the beans here, uh, but right now, a very important thing for Playo is that we become what we refer to as API first, meaning we're actually refactoring a lot of work, fixing or changing how we build things at Playo. Now with that narrative running, that is also something that we expect a lot of teams to tap into and say, how are we going to um, prioritize our work in a way that fits with this narrative that we are now pushing as a company? And so there's, yeah, I think, I hope that answers it a little bit. Um, but I think my point is more of these sort of company-wide directions, do we expect more and more teams to be able to tie into those? Um, yeah, more now than we've done in the past. And, and what tool is it that you moved to? Can you just say that? For, for, for what? For prioritization, for road mapping, for, yeah, for yeah, what? Yeah. All road of them. Mapping? Well, okay. <laughs> well, uh, well um, right now, actually, we are using Notion for our roadmaps. Um, for those who use Notion, uh, it's a lovely tool. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's some, the search needs to be fixed, but uh, generally speaking, I, I, I really love Notion. Uh, so we're actually using their um, the databases in there to um, to build roadmaps. Um, then we yeah we're also using a project management tool called Linear, where you can also actually have some 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 projects running, and you can see some some more detailed um, stuff on your on your on your work streams. But we're using Linear. Uh, sorry, no, we used to use Product Mode. Yeah, but you don't know. Nope. 
too expensive. Okay, perfect. So, so we, we've got a few questions left now. Out of time, sorry, Mikael, I'm just going to read it up. Uh, uh, so, so who prioritizes the roadmap at Pleo? Uh, okay. Right. So that that is a a question that is not just one sort of person to answer. Um, but ultimately, there's one person that is accountable for the final roadmap for a team as an example. And that is what we call the team lead. And that's I referred to our operating model earlier. In that, we have all these different titles. And one of them is a team lead. And that team lead is ultimately accountable for the final version of the roadmap. But to build that roadmap, that person needs to align to the area strategy and the area sort of leaders and has to, uh, of course, engage with the team members and all these different things. But if you just want one person, that is the team lead for the team. Then you also have an area lead, or we call them a domain lead. That person is responsible for that part of the business. Then you go even further, right? So hmm. there isn't one person for one roadmap, um, but there is one person for the roadmap in that particular unit. All right, thank you. And then there's one last question. It's, uh, it's a longer one. So I'm actually gonna ask you, Helen, if you can uh, read that out loud. If Helen yes, is I yeah yeah I'm here. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so my question is basically um, when you go through the process of deciding which variables you want to use as a prioritization method, um, who who is doing that uh, the groundwork on identifying those variables, deciding you know you know this this uh, quarter is it the is it the customer that's important or is it something else? Uh, is it mm -hmm. high level management or is that um, decentralized down to the teams as well? Do you get yeah. everybody involved or is it just a, a quick snap decision? No, that's a great, great, great question. And ultimately, it's up to the team lead. Uh, so that could be, it, it, it tends to be in, in our employer, but it isn't always a product manager. We also have a lot of, a lot of teams where it's an engineer um, who's responsible for, for that. Uh, but there is sort of a I'm not going to call it a, a safety that isn't the right word, but there is sort of there are some mechanisms around the team lead, where the team leader has a support group, and that support group also are quite uh, quite strong in that that particular area of the business. So they will they might also have input like, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? And so on and so forth. So, but ultimately it, it is up to the team lead. But we then package some some people around that person to to empower that person to make the best possible decisions essentially. Yeah. Great. Cool. Thank you. All right. And if you have more questions, of course, a little plug, you can book Casper for a mental call. You could even book it tonight <laughs> at runningloop.io, right? So uh, go book him right away. So thank you so much. Uh, next up is, let me just get the slides here. Uh, surprise, surprise. Who is it? Let's see. It is Kla. Can we have it up? Is it coming? It is right here. This is Kla, and uh, she has prepared uh, a an awesome uh, presentation for you. I have seen a few slides, and I mean, this is this is next level presentation skills in terms of. Uh, this is different. This is going to be it's different. It's different. It's different, right? Um, yeah. So I'm I'm for that alone. I am really looking forward uh, to it. So um, you know, even though Clara has vast experience with leadership roles within product and tech to rely on. Um, she has taken an, another interesting starting point in her talk. Uh, she has based many of the dilemmas she unravels on the mentor sessions she had through Learning Loop. Uh, so you could say that she did pretty good uh, user research for this talk. Uh, Clara is going to talk about product rotation and roadmap alignment. So again, I suggest that if you have any questions during Clara's talk, then write them in the chat and we'll take them just like we did now in the Q&A session uh, afterwards. So uh, Clara? Uh, super yes, excited. Hey, Ray, steal my screen. Yes, I will. Um, and thank you, Casper. I can promise you all that I went in a completely different direction. <laughs> and we haven't even co coordinated this. So, um, so I was actually uh, in a bit of a pickle because I was discussing with myself if I should uh, uh, name a lot of the frameworks, go through uh, all these different war stories. And there will be a few war stories, um, but actually, I decided to, to uh, go on a different starting point. 
which is uh, a lot about psychology and communication and how you actually rally your organization through storytelling and different other tricks. Um, I didn't actually do a, a first slide on, on my background, but I've been in, uh, in the media and telco industry for many years uh, as head of development and product. Uh, latest, I was at the Clio and EdTech, and we sold the company uh, during this fall. So I've been diving and getting a puppy and stuff like that in the meantime. Uh, so if you hear snoring, it's because my puppy is just beside me here, uh, and uh, she uh, she's not attacking you right now. So that is a good start. Um, I will just uh, start my slides. Uh, what I do sometimes, because I, I've been in a 25 years of slideshows, so sometimes I get so tired, so I do something a bit different. So what I've been doing for today is that I've been doing it by hand instead. And uh, I hope you can read it. Um, there's not that many details, but it's a great way for me to actually uh, try and be very precise and not too long because it's so easy to write a lot of text. Uh, yeah, so I just need to find it. Mm -hmm. I had uh, to change computer in the last minute, so... Uh, I was, saw that uh, you had it up, so in a bit of a it, it should work, right? Yeah, yeah, but now it doesn't show uh, the window, which is really weird. Okay, just a moment, everyone. Yeah, yeah. anybody, uh, anybody uh, knows a good I... joke while we're waiting? A good dad joke, <laughs> or maybe I'll just ask a chat GPT uh, a joke about meetups. Let's see what it says. Don't. It's a cliffhanger. I know. I'm just loading here. So I'll just write a prompt saying, "What is a good joke for meetups?" Just hold on, Clara. <laughs> when these <laughs> unfortunately shows want be so shared or appear on the screen. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Okay, so, so there's a cliffhanger. Is whoa, my God! That oh, is. Oh, whoa. That is so that 80s. <laughs> okay, so it's good that I, I wrote that prompt. So it's coming up with the, with a joke now. Okay, ready, guys? I was thinking. Uh, apparently, like every every single time I use ChatGPT, it's overloaded. And uh, this is also the case. So I'll just reload. That's a joke in itself. Let's see here. I don't know why. It doesn't want to share. Um, wait a minute. Oh man. This is typical, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, come on chat, keep it, you can, you can do it for me. So maybe you can just move it to another window or something. I try it. Okay, so um, this chat TBG says, here's a classic joke that might work well in a meetup setting when the slideshows aren't appearing on screen. Are you guys ready? Why did the computer go to the doctor? Because it had a virus? That is like the worst joke ever. I'm gonna ask again. <laughs> I'm just gonna try uh, something. I'm really sorry if it worked. Uh... We actually tested it. We did our testing. We tested it just before we started. We had such a good build up with the hand drawings and everything. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm trying to open it from. So why don't scientists trust atoms? Atoms, because they make up everything. Uh, man, this is. These are really bad. Can you see Why it now? Yes. Yes. 
That yes. is good. But but now I, I can't see you guys. So um all right, that's how it is. Yeah, that's how it is because I'm sharing directly from Dropbox. Um oh, okay. so I hope it it the uh, it works. Uh it does. Okay, let's try. Um <clears throat> While while you were talking, Casper, I was I was actually thinking uh, about something that I have been probably saying I don't know a few thousand times uh, for the last five years at least, which is uh, when we talk about roadmaps, I always talk about uh, that it's important to underpromise and overdeliver. Uh, and when I started at TV Two. Uh, I was responsible for uh, all the digital development of all the digital uh, products, uh, which means uh, T2 Play, uh, uh, T2.dk, and all the uh, applications. And it was a very old legacy platform. Um, and what I realized from the very beginning was that everybody, when you talk to anyone in the organization, they were disappointed beforehand. Even, even though the, the development department, we haven't even talked about what we were going to do, everybody was disappointed. Nothing is happening down there. Uh, they're bad at estimation. Uh, there, were, there was a lot of stuff going on. And, and what I realized was basically that if you need to rally your organization, you need to do a different storytelling. Um, and that is actually also some of the things that I've been talking a lot to um, to a lot of the mentees about in uh, in Learning Loop. So I, I tried to make, make like a small recap on what have we actually talked about. Um, and one of the things is that the ones that I've talked to and also the ones that I've been working with uh, for many years, this is some of the things that they are saying about themselves. So I'm just an all-rounder. Uh, I feel like a human switchboard. So people come to me and I just set, pass them on to the right one. Uh, I'm a stand-in for management. I'm the one you only see in meetings. I'm in a meeting room all the time. Some of you can probably recognize that. Um, I know a little about everything, but I'm not an expert. Uh, I'm the naysayer. If anybody wants to, to know where we're going, they won't send it to me because I'm just saying no. Uh, I feel like I'm the only one that actually feels a responsibility to create value. And product manager, a lot of product managers feels like actually being coordinators. That's also the switchboard thing. I don't know if any of you can, uh, can recognize some of this, but I think this is uh, pretty, pretty common, basically, uh, the feelings that are going on here. Um, Another thing about roles and responsibilities. Um, this is, of course, something that we talk a lot about in the sessions as well. And I have been trying to dig a bit in what I can see there are some tendencies regarding uh, the companies. And this is really general, but, but I've, I've done it anyway. So in, this, in the smaller companies where there are 50 people or less, or it could be startups. There are some different things that are that are similar. There's a lack of focus in general. Uh, there's also a lack of uh, titles that doesn't match the roles or the responsibilities that the product people are in. Um, it is hard to know what is important. Um, and this is also because usually the smaller companies they're not that structured all the time uh, concerning roadmaps and especially in long term. There's also uh, the, the personal career thing about, so how do I actually expand uh, the, my responsibility and how do I develop further on? That can be often quite unclear in, in a small company. And then there's also often the feeling that management takes the final decision or the opposite, not at all. And this can, can of course be discussed. So this is just some, some general uh, things that I have, have seen while talking to people. When it's in uh, between 150 and 250 uh, people and scale-ups uh, been in the market for some time, uh, usually 
uh, there's a lot of problems with the processes because it's the same processes when they were for 40 people. So the shift in how they work uh, has not been updated. A lot of experts has become managers. So to make sure that some of the really smart people and experienced people don't leave, they have become managers. And maybe that's not the best thing always. Uh, it's very unclear what the long-term goals uh, basically is. And management is just like, oh, just be agile. We will, we will make it just do what, what, we, what we used to do. Uh, you know what to do. And decision can easily change from day to day. That's probably a, a basic thing for uh, all companies. But I see a tendency here. So when it's larger corporations and more than 300 people, and then maybe Casper, you can see if I'm right now, but um, management uh, impact decision can be in a very modded way. It can be they go by your desk, or uh, it can be uh, suddenly that someone comes out from an executive meeting and then they have a decision that goes the opposite direction of what was decided for the roadmap two weeks ago and you have no idea what's actually been going on within the room. Uh, well, well found the processes get bypassed because they've been seeing stuff working for so long. So, so the, the thing about working with, the, with processes is like, oh, they'll be fine, we'll make it, we know how it works. And then there are the ones <clears throat> who always uh, the most take this decision, and the reason why I'm writing X is actually because this is the loudest voice, uh, or the the CX something, um, the ones that always wants to make uh, uh, the biggest impact by being loudest. There's often gaps between uh, strategy and daily development and operations. Um, when you when you're in large corporations, I were also in UC and TTC for almost six years. That's 10,000 people. Uh, and to be completely honest, I used a lot of my time try and translate strategy, what the strategy meant for our department. And uh, we were uh, doing everything that was related to streaming in UC and TTC. And we were having a quite a big impact uh, on the customers. So, and, and for me, it was quite frustrating that if our people don't understand the strategy, how can anyone else? So this is a common thing that black corporations do strategies, but they don't really go that deep down uh, into the corporation. And then across countries and decentralized, this is more like, can you hear me? I just want to make sure. Um, then across countries and decentralized companies, uh, it can be uh, someone that's getting bored or having small uh, parts of companies sitting around in, in different parts of the world. Um, strategic alignment can differ a lot and it can mean, mean a lot of frustration for people in general. Titles and roles may be very different. So even though both are product owners, uh, it can be, completely different what they're actually doing in their everyday life. A focus on new development uh, is, is something that is uh, articulated very, very clearly often, but legacy is ignored. It's not something that we talk about, it's just something to get fixed. Market drivers makes it very difficult to prioritize across countries. And of course it does, because usually the systems doesn't work in the same way. Uh, the markets are not the same maturity, and so on. What you can also probably do with all these is that you can put them into one big uh, pile and you can put them into a bowl, and when we can take one up at each time, and then you can raise your hand if you notice it. Uh, and if it's part of your daily work or you've been try uh, trying to, to work in these conditions. But I think it's quite normal. But these are something that, of course, these things uh, focus a lot on how our daily work, um, that the struggles we have, and a lot of it is actually based on how we interact as, as human beings in general. So, 
one I see often is uh, that there's a lot of focus on what what manage, management want and what management expect and what they do and 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 how they make their decisions. And uh, I just try to 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 like take a few things. What do I think the mission of management is? So now it's general, right? Of course, they want to create a great workspace. They want to make money. They want to be successful. Um, they want to build outstanding pro uh, products. Uh, they want to develop themselves. They want to learn, to have purpose. Um, and I'm quite sure that that's the same thing for product people. So the reason why I did this is also, I know I'm chunking it up a lot and I generalize, but we have a lot of focus on in our daily lives what makes us different instead of actually speaking to the parts where we agree. And that's the same thing with everyone else in your company. Maybe everyone else uh, are not set to set the right direction, but as product people, they we usually have a, a feeling of wanting to set a direction and wanting to get people uh, on board and, and, and go ahead. But it's just to say we can focus a lot on what makes us different and what's uh, where we disagree. And that is, that is what we do when we talk about participation. But there are actually uh, more tricky ways to go. Uh, and I have used it a lot, to be completely honest. Uh, I just have to say I have a master's in uh, NLP as well. And um, I'm reading my, on my psychotherapist um, uh, education as well. And, and many would call this man manipulation. But I actually, I would just call it being very wise about how to communicate. But that's up for you to uh, to decide. So there's a very big difference from setting the direction and creating an attraction. And the difference here is that creating a direction is something that's motivated and driven by external forces. So you as a product manager, you go out and you create a direction and you get people to go with you. But if you create an attraction instead and you motivate by internal forces and feelings, then it's actually a lot stronger. And then people will follow you uh, much farther and be loyal and think of the way you're going together in very, very different ways. So it's just to say that Direction is one thing, making an attraction, making to want people to jump on board, on board this is completely different. So, uh, just a little about the brain here. Um, every second, around 80, uh, 80 million thoughts or uh, impulses go through our brain. If we are very awake, and it's uh, not past eight in the evening, we are maybe conscious about 30 to 40 of them. So what we want to do is that if we want to rally our people behind what we're doing and we want to do something together, our positive thoughts are so much stronger than negative thoughts. And I know this is so easy to say, but I just want you to remember it, that this is actually a very, very important tool when we talk about discussing roadmaps, discussing about how we take decisions, discuss uh, in general uh, how the processes are in an organization, what we want to achieve. And this is also why if you, when you communicate, focus on questions that are formulated where people can only say yes, then it's easier to agree. So it's just to say, if, if I, for example, say to all of you, oh, uh, can we agree that it would be really, really nice if we earned $10,000 each more every month? That is an obvious yes question for everyone. So think about it, because something happens and the feelings get activated when we do stuff like that. So there are three things and I cho chose three things that I think will help you uh, when you 
when you align priorities and when you use your roadmap very actively. Um, one, you need to map your reality. Uh, when I have some of the mentor sessions, uh, I ask a lot of questions. Uh, you can ask Karen here on this call. I ask a lot of questions about how does your everyday life look? Uh, what is your reality? Who is taking the decisions and so on? And, and this is actually interesting uh, to do as well in a company where you've been for maybe uh, three years. You can easily do it. But the thing is that we do a lot of stuff that is actually unconscious. We don't really think about it. There are people that we have really good chemistry with, and there are some that where the chemistry could uh, be better. But when you map it, you have a better overview of what is actually going on. And this is what can actually help you take decisions in a different way. So you can make a value chain for decisions. So usually a decision, uh, starts with an idea and, and uh, goes on a roadmap somehow. That is uh, what everyone wishes that gets a good idea. Um, this is just examples. But what you can do when you, uh, when you actually map this, you, you might go th through different kinds of stakeholders. So, so who is actually involved when there's the data insights uh, and the UXs? There are probably a UX that you would like to do stuff with and for some things and another for other things. Why is that? Um, so, so you can map it in, in the, any way you want. But the thing is, all this, we can have this, these different processes, but you all know that this is basically how the road looks. And if you look down in the bottom, when there's a presentation for management, I've drawn a small atom bomb because everything can happen when it's get, getting pres presented for management. So what I did when I started at TV2, uh, I did it at Clio as well, and I actually did it also at UC, was that I made uh, meeting forums where it was mandatory for people to show up. That was including managers, my managers as well. And what I basically said was, the ones who shows up, is the one that makes the decisions. So if you're not there, you're not part of the decision. And uh, that is, of course, a gamble, but it worked. So what happened was that the first five weeks uh, the, at TV2, I remember there's like 40 people in a room uh, every week for the demos and the talk about the roadmap. That was how it looked for six weeks. Then it slowly faded out until it was actually the 12 people across the organization that was actually working hands-on with some of the, the things that showed up. But the thing was that we, we actually, uh, so when you talk about public roadmaps, for example, Karen, um, this is not a public roadmap, but it's a public involvement inside your company internally to say, we got, got nothing to hide. Everybody can show up and they can, they can affect the decisions. But we decide uh, for our roadmaps and whatever we do, because what we put on our roadmaps affects the customers and it costs us money. So we decide on data. So for example, there was uh, something, someone from uh, the management group that came with an idea. And, and uh, she did it in a forum where there were a lot of people and it sounded basically like this. So when I'm at home sitting with my iPad and I want to see a show, something like this is happening. I would prefer if it was something like this instead. Uh, and the thing is that you need to be open and positive and, and a yes, yes person to actually grab it because she's interested. The manager is interested and she, She's not there to actually ruin the, the whole process about uh, uh, user testing and stuff like that. She's, she's interested in doing a better customer experience. But this is her way. She, she thinks that, that her personal opinion is actually a good thing to uh, air that. So what we did was, when something like that happened, we made very, very sure that when we were user testing, we took them, 
and then we we put them into a big pile and all our user testing was completely open and i always said that I really, uh, I really want, want all your uh, opinions and, and your stories, but you have to remember that this is a one-person user test. In Danish, I call it a one-person gallop, and, and uh, we can't use that. If we do that, then we have 5 million people in Denmark that can basically do that, and it would be too expensive for us to do it. So this was my way of handling uh, the top management when they came with ideas. Another thing you can do is that you can look to the circle of influence. And uh, this, is, this is very, very simple. Uh, you have some kind of decision on that, something that irritates you. Where, do, where does, does this decision actually been taken? You can make a whole lot more uh, rings here. But a really good uh, example was that at TDC, there was a huge change in uh, in the whole area so they had to uh, remove i think it was 100 parking spaces or something and we had a morning meeting and there was like a a, a revolution and and there were my department was around 100 people and everybody was angry and i didn't understand what was going on and of course it was regarding they couldn't find a parking spot and this went on for weeks so at one of our morning meetings where everybody was really angry once more, I drew this and I said, so I would really, really like to help, but can we place this problem with the parking? Because for me, it's, it's difficult that we keep talking about it if we don't have any influence on the decision anyway. We use a lot of time on it in this department, but do we actually have any impact? So this is a way of actually stopping what you're, what, what you're discussing. Uh, it's a way of actually going into saying, can we actually do something about it? If we can't, maybe we shouldn't use any time of it. I can uh, make a small recommendation that it's very interesting to make this uh, with, with, when you're talking about influencing what your boss does and, and what your boss's boss do and stuff like that. It's also interesting to do it with your spouse. So how, how much effect can you actually do when it's your spouse or your family or your friends? So next time you get irritated, try and do one of these. Second, um, choose your frameworks wisely. And this is, uh, this is just to say, I, th th this was where I was actually just about to uh, make a lot of different frameworks that I actually uh, used. But what I have to say is that we need to accept that management will always want a deadline. They will always wish for something to launch. So you need to figure out how to communicate that. And when we talk about legacy, it's difficult because they don't want to hear about it. But what I figured out was actually that the dependency board was a very, very concrete way of actually showing management why legacy was difficult and how it actually, we struggled with it. So it's just the dependency was very effective for, for me. Um, so, so it's just to say, you need to figure out what we're actually working with. And often there's way too, too much introduced. You need to find a different, uh, simple way to, uh, to communicate. So it doesn't matter what you choose. What, met, what matters is that you're consistent. And there were, there were actually a few uh, questions about that in the beginning uh, on the poll uh, as well. Take whatever is the easiest thing and stick to it. Stick to it and make sure that, that as a product manager, you're a spider in the web. You need to make sure that management understands what we're talking about. And you need to explain it maybe 50 times but every time you need to explain it to them, like with high enthusiasm and uh, see it as it's because they actually care. But it is difficult to, uh, to prioritize and to agree because we don't speak the same language. So you need to ensure that you actually speak the same language. So if you use sprints, 
you need to be sure that they actually understand what a sprint is. And back to the brain, use the positive things. And when you have meetings, don't be afraid of use two extra minutes saying, making sure, is it clear what we're talking about? Uh, is everybody with me? So is everybody with me? This is quite important. Look at people. Do they smile? Are they attentive? Do they look like someone that wants to kill themselves? Because either they don't agree or they don't understand what is going on. So it's really, really important that you uh, look at them and figure out that maybe there's someone that you need to talk to afterwards. Casper mentioned it as well. If you have a marketing uh, profile and you have an engineer, probably there's different ways of them to, to jump on uh, the idea. But it can be done. It can be done, but you need to be uh, you need to be patient and you need to be positive. So then there's the agreement on the roadmap. Do a confidence vote. Ask ask again. Make sure that you are all aligned. And here's this very important for me to say: being aligned is not the same the same as being uh, uh, that, that we're all agreeing. So it's important that the the impact of the roadmap that people understand that so this is probably not a a big a, a big surprise for any of you but but the casper mentioned it as well the th the three steps that we always need to be ready to answer as product people is that why we want to do this what are we doing precisely and i have to say uh, this is where we jump into solutions on how we do it. Uh, and I see this very, very often that management are talking about, we want this and we want this for this reason. And then they just uh, hope that somebody from a product or engineering take it from here and then figure out how. But it's the what that is actually very, very important when we're talking about being precise here. And, and that is why it's important to choose your language because are we just doing an MVP or is the idea that they're having huge, maybe we should start with 10% of it. This is where the language comes in. And this is where you should focus a lot of your energy. And not the least very important, sorry, my, uh, my puppy is now uh, waking up. Um, who will help you? How do you make sure that you're on the right track? How do you make sure that everybody in engineering is actually feeling supported and, and protected by you? How do you make sure that the marketing backs you up when you do the road mapping? Um, and I can say just for, for last, when I started at TV2 and we talked about the under promise over deliver, I realized, of course, that the way they do did the uh, estimates was very different from team to team. Uh, I was there for three and a half years, and there were 40 people when I started, and more than 100 when I stopped. Uh, we we shifted every single part of uh, of all play, the play platform and applications and infrastructure, uh, except for the subscription. Uh, I didn't uh, I assigned the contract before I left, but I didn't implement it. But what I figured out was that they were they underestimated the legacy heavily. So I said, from now on, we deduct hours for, from the legacy before we even talk about what we're doing. So let's say we have 100 perfect hours uh, in a month. Then we, we take 30 of those. 30 hours of those are always legacy, and we don't talk to management about it. They don't care. They just want to make sure it works. After that, we have 70 hours left. Because we're so bad at doing estimates, let's deduct 50% of those. So you can estimate well, 35 hours, perfect hours a month. That is what you can do when you're, when you're trying to do the roadmap. And as you can probably imagine, people were very, very frustrated and angry. But what happened was that within six months, we actually were on the mark of our roadmap. We learned a lot. We had the time to actually do our legacy and we could do it like 
that we were over delivering. So something that management had heard about for many years, suddenly it was gone because we just did it while we did the other stuff. But when I communicated and we made the storytelling and I had luckily a lot of really, really good product managers to help here, the storytelling about all the things that we achieved with the 35 hours was really, really what we focused on. So if you change the, the spotlight to the positive things and talk about the customer impact on that, you can actually ready your organization and especially your engineering teams because they get some calmness to actually deal with all the legacy. That was it. Uh, and I will, uh, on sharing, uh, I will stop it at once so I can actually see you guys. Awesome. Thank you so much. I, I, I feel like I wanted to listen for 30 minutes more. Awesome. Great. So, so, um, so there's a lot of good tips and I, I could see myself wanting to apply them all, but you know, it, it's also quite hard to, to master, I guess. So, so my, my first question here is like, which one of all these tips would you think are the most impactful? Like which one would you focus on mastering the first? Um, the thing about always, uh, always formulating your, sorry, uh, read my copy. I'm just putting her down. Um, always focusing on being positive and uh, making people to say yes. Making sure that people come aboard. Think a lot about your storytelling because it's basically just about doing stuff a bit differently. Because we're product people, we're so good at focusing on what's the problem instead mm. of saying, wow, there's so many solutions. Because we know there's a problem. That's why we're doing it. So, so I would say, for me personally, when I started to uh, use the psychology behind it instead, I could see a big, big difference in how people reacted and how they uh, gathered around the roadmap. I, I, was, uh, I got uh, uh, resumes from other meetings in other departments where they explained our roadmap to the department in marketing. And I was like, what? There was no one from product or development there. So, so I think that would be the one. Think yes all the time, getting them to follow you. What do you think is more important, like rallying people around your vision and your roadmap or, you know, doing product right, like, you know, doing outcome over output and you know, all those things that we tell ourselves that this is the right way to do it. Which one yeah. would you rather focus on? Well, there's no outcome without output, this, a bit like Casper said. Um, mm. So for me, outcome is something that we can measure. Where output is tangible, often tangible things for customers. And it doesn't really matter. Um, it doesn't really matter as long as we celebrate whatever we do. And that we actually mm. also mm. make sure to... Uh, kill some of it as well because i think there's a lot of, the thing about killing stuff is actually a very important part of uh, of the storytelling especially when we talk about legacy hmm. because that's also also always been my way of uh, talking about is saying but the reason why we have legacy so much legacy is because we don't kill the stuff that doesn't work so this is also why we do user testing so that's a good way of explaining it but yeah. but I, I I maybe it's stupid, but I really think a lot about my mother when I try to explain these things to top, top management or other departments, because we can make it all all sound really really uh, uh, really bad um, or or difficult, but but we can also make it easy and and make them feel that they can. They can, or Clara will fix that. I don't have to think about it. Yeah. So that that's my goal, right? And I guess when you have that trust, you can carve out a space where you can do all the fun stuff in the way that you exactly. want. But with without it, that becomes very hard. You don't have trust, and you have to fight to do it, right? Yeah. Yeah. So Olivier, do you have a question? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? And you? Yes. I don't know if you can see me. I got very poor lightning here. 
Uh, love the presentation of both of you. Thanks, guys. That's been that's been awesome. And Clara just wanted to say that I really love the the starting point of you know attractions versus motivation of uh, external versus internal uh, uh, intrinsic motivators. That that's actually something super cool. Um, but the, the question that I have is actually more about the roadmap part because what you present is as an example of a roadmap. I won't call that a roadmap. For me, that's a release plan. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a Gantt chart of features. You know. Uh, with a lot of dependencies and when when they are going to to do, which is o often yeah. what management in the the companies that you that you have said it would would want to see. Uh, but what's what's your take on on something that goes a bit more behind that, like you know a bit like the now next later type of roadmap? How can you use some of uh, the, the the tips and tricks that you that you shared to to actually yeah. have people not so only focus on solution because. A bit like when you're doing discovery or, or talking to customers, they don't describe the problem that they have. They describe like the like solution that they would like. And I, I believe that a lot of management has the, the same tendency. So what's, yeah. uh, what's your tip on that? So your first question uh, about, I, I completely agree, that looks like a release plan. Uh, but that's not how I worked with it. I actually, on purpose for many years, used the Gantt way, but I ju we just did it in my room, basically. So we still did it quite high level. We did it for three months, and then we did it for 12 months to 18 months. And then we used a lot of time to actually uh, explain this is a certainty when we decided to work on something for three months, nothing gets changed unless there's a fire somewhere. Um, and I always talked about following the money. So I talked a lot about always how much it would cost us if we stop development that is already ongoing, blah, blah, blah. Um, and again, it's where you set the spotlight. I set the spotlight on the three to six months. What's to expect next? And then what are we discovering? Um, and I also, I think it's very important to, to be uh, open and saying, so we're discovering the whole part about that we would like to implement the uh, chat uh, uh, because we can see the AI now is it can help us with a lot. But that doesn't mean that we will implement it everywhere. It means that maybe we will do a small portion of it first. So the whole MPV, uh, MVP uh, thought, uh, I used a lot of time on that, especially saying, but then we don't, don't use that much money. We try it out, we see how it goes, and if it's really as, as cool as we think it is, then we can do it full blow. So, so I used money a lot when I talked, uh, because that's resources, um, and I was very transparent about all the user tests and our MPS uh, scores and stuff like that, to make sure that, to tell them we are monitoring the things we do and if it works. And if it doesn't work, we remove it. And then we celebrate that as well. So every time we killed something, it was also every time uh, the engineering teams, they wanted to buy something new. Oh, there's a cool tool somewhere. I said, you can buy it if you remove two others. And that is basically uh, how we uh, ended up getting uh, legacy down quite quickly as well. He said, you can buy everything you want if you remove two things. So, um, so it's difficult. It's, it's also depending on what kind of management you have. Uh, is there already trust or is it, is it difficult? If, if the trust is, is uh, lacking a bit, it can be difficult just to, to go ahead. Hmm. Was it an uh, answer enough? Perfect, thanks a lot. All right, all right. Any other questions? I think uh, the lack of questions doesn't mean that uh, it wasn't quite insightful. I think uh, uh, at least I am still digesting the thing. And so if I can ask you questions tomorrow, and uh, <laughs> I yeah. would love that. Okay. <laughs> um, of course, you can also, if you don't have that privilege, uh, you uh, you can, of course, uh, go book uh, Clara for, for a call. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> Let's... Um, Let's have a, uh, a round of applause for both Casper and uh, Clara, who've actually qu spent quite a lot of time uh, preparing for today. Thank you guys for, for showing up. 
um, if uh, 